Uh, I've just been told uh, that we've got a panel coming up with someone who's joining us that wasn't originally planned, but she will be joining. She's a friend of mine, and she's absolutely amazing, so I implore you to stay put. Uh, Oscar-nominated actress Naomi Harris is going to be joining us for one of our panels shortly, so please stick around. Okay. Are you ready for another conversation? Yes or no? Yes? 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 You sound tired, which is ridiculous, considering how much free food and drink you've had. She's finished her sandwich, thank the Lord. But if you need another one for energy, it's free and it's just over there. So are you ready for another conversation? Yeah. There we are. Okay, uh, next up, we are going to be talking materials. But before Bianca guides us through, check this out. I've had this piece in my closet for almost 10 years now. And I remember it being more expensive than what I'd normally spend and thinking, I really need to make this last. It made me think about how remarkable it is that it's landed in my wardrobe. The journey the fabric goes on, where it comes from, the impact it makes, what it's made of, and the roles different people play along the way. When I bought this, there was no discussion about sustainability. If it did come up, you'd think, scratchy fabrics, not fashion. It blows my mind how far things have come. Take this Air Ink t-shirt. It's made from using a new technology that creates ink from air pollution. These cork shoes are made of, well, actual wine corks. This sweater is made of ethical cashmere wool. Reminds me that not all material needs to be recycled. Natural fibers actually break down really easily. Today, being eco-conscious doesn't mean sacrificing style for sustainability. I'm never going to stop caring about what I wear, where it comes from, and where it goes next. So thank you very much for that, Monica. Monica will be joining me on stage very shortly, but before we welcome our next panelists, I kind of wanted to just talk about my own story for the past 10 years and how sustainable fashion has moved in that time. I started doing, like, influencing and blogging, what, 10 years ago. And I did work with fast fashion brands, but over that kind of time, I've changed my mindset and looked and educated myself. And that's why platforms like this are so important. So we're just grateful to see you guys here. So I'd like to welcome up the next, le the next lot of panelists. So joining me on stage will soon be Monica Poppy, sustainable influencer, Howard Williams, director of global innovation at Apparel at Puma, Mohammed Jabbar, MD of DBL Bangladesh, Ashley Gill, Chief Strategy Officer of Textile Exchange, and Dana Shu, Director of Development at Global Fashion Agenda. Come on up, guys. So thank you all for joining me for my second panel. We've moved over here this time. Um, as always, if you guys are at home and you do want to ask a question, please feel free to do so and use the hashtag PumaCop. And then I will be going to a Q&A at the end for those of you in the room. Just raise your hand as we said before. So let's get started. So Howard, why is Puma focusing on materials? Why is it important? Great question. Um, basically, in apparel, the materials are 50% of the product, at least, sometimes yeah. up to 70%, depending on the size of the garment. So materials are obviously a choice to focus on sustainability, and it's also the area of a product which uh, the general public relates to quite easily. They know what cotton is, they know what polyester is, they know what wool is. So it's something they sort of relate to quite quickly. Mm -hmm. So that's where we target working on sustainability. Anybody else? Why is this, why is like why are materials sorry so important? Why should we be focusing on them? I'll jump in here. Yeah, go for it. Textile Exchange is a nonprofit that actually focuses on the fiber and material part of the supply chain. We've been working with brands and suppliers and raw material producers for a number of years to transition to a more sustainable usage of materials. And we think that starting with materials is a good idea, both for the reasons that Howard mentioned. It can uh, take up anywhere from 30 to 45% of a product's overall footprint, depending on what type of material it is, what type of product it is. Uh, but another really important reason to start with materials is that this is where the product starts. It starts at the farm. It starts at, uh, in some cases, fossil fuel extraction. And we feel like this is a great analogy for the foundation of transitioning to an overall sustainable business. Materials are the foundation. It's a great part, a great way to introduce yourself to where your product is actually coming from and the people and the environments that it are, are part of that throughout the way. No, definitely. I 
love that. That's a really nice way of putting it, so thank you. Um, Mohammed, can you tell us about the recycling of cotton, please? Hello, thank you. Uh, cotton, uh, cotton can be recycled, and we are doing it in DBL. It is like recycling paper. Uh, uh, in the recycling process, the cotton fiber gets cut into pieces, and if you use some more, if you add more recycled content, then uh, quality may suffer. Uh, of, to, for for uh, you know, just is uh, securing the quality. We are limiting uh, the percentage of recycled cotton uh, to uh, approximate 20 percent within a garments. Another aspect is dyes. In recycling process, dyes cannot be removed. For recycling cotton, so the cotton fiber should be separated by color. Another way, the recycle can, uh, I mean, it can recycle to, uh, uh, it, is, it can be recycled uh, uh, to other products like, you know, uh, then, you know, this is, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. It, yeah, this is, it can be recycled to viscose or viscose-like materials. Here, uh, here uh, the cotton can be dissolved into pulp and pulp, uh, the pulp, and then uh, respinning uh, re the fiber, respinning the new fiber from this pulp. Yeah. No, fantastic. It's a very lengthy process, I'm sure. And I'm glad that you raised something on dyes there because we spoke about that on the previous panel where dyes can't be recycled. So it makes the process much more lengthy. Mm -hmm. So Dana, I just wanted to point a question to you and say, how do you see the ups upscaling of recycled materials, such as cotton, as Mohammed said, developing within the fashion industry? Yeah, thank you for the question. So Global Fashion Agenda is a nonprofit organization that mobilizes, educates, and encourages the industry to collaborate toward a net positive fashion industry. Yeah. So an interesting fact is less than 1% of textiles produced are currently recycled into new ones. And out of all the recycled materials today, only a small amount are actually made from textiles. A lot of the other is plastic bottles, which is quite surprising. We heard from the previous panel um, that brands have made massive commitments to commit to recycled materials. I think we heard Puma saying up to 100% of recycled materials. However, there's a huge gap right now between brands' commitments and the actual availability of the recycled materials. So at Global Fashion Agenda, we focused on a solution to increase the availability of recycled materials um, through our circular fashion partnership. We launched in Bangladesh two years ago, and we're upscaling um, to three more countries and manufacturing countries. And basically what we do is we map the pre-consumer waste. So we heard the definition of that um, earlier on the panel, post-industrial waste, pre-consumer waste. We recycle that waste, and then we redistribute the recycled material to manufacturers. And the Circular Fashion Partnership has demonstrated the business opportunity of scaling recycling technologies. And we found that the fashion industry can actually become 80% circular by 2030 with the right investment. So of course, we need to actually scale the recycling technologies. But with the brand's demand, which we know that we have, plus the actual access to the waste, we can create a really compelling um, business opportunity for investors. That is a staggering point, like 80% by 2030, with the right investment, obviously. And when you think about it, 2030 isn't that far away. It's, n it's Eight no years time. to go. It's not that far at all. Yeah. Um, and more to the point on like materials and things and fi fibers and how we make the composition of clothing. Traditionally, and over what the past sort of 50, 60 years, polyester has been such a huge component in clothing. And I think if you look at anything over the past 20 years, you will be able to see on that care label, there's definitely some polyester in most of clothes that we all wear. Um, and Howard, how, can you talk us through the process of how polyester is made? And how have you been able to make it more, I want to say, quote unquote, sustainable? Um, basically, polyester is made from two components. One is ethylene glycol and the other is terephthalic acid. 
and they're put together and there's condensation and you get um, polymerization of the polymer. Okay. And then that can be transformed through extrusion into fibers and into filaments and then made into spinning process through to fabrics and garments. So what we're trying to do with the recycling side of it is reverse that process. Okay. So we collect um, polyester waste, mm -hmm. gar used garments, uh, cuttings from the garment making process, and we depolymerize the polyester to produce like a polyester soup. Uh, you, any of the color that's in the fabric will be in the soup, and then we filter the soup out to get clear polyester, and then we can re-extrude that into van brand new virgin polyester again. And as Anne mentioned before in the previous uh, panel, um, this process is infinite. We can go round and round and round again because we're breaking the polyester down into its building blocks and then recombining it once we've taken the dye out. I'm not going to lie, that doesn't sound very appetising. <laughs> Nobody wants to eat polyester soup at all. Um, that's really interesting, though. Um, is there a difference? I mean, could you maybe explain and go into a little bit more detail about the difference between virgin polyester and recycle, just so that the audience can get a further understanding? Basically, the, the building blocks of polyester are fossil fuels, so fossil base comes from petroleum, yep. and they're combined. And for the recycling, you're taking finished polyester and reversing the process back to its building blocks. Okay, cool. So you're actually really recycling it again, yeah. rather than taking fresh um, yeah. fossil-based chemicals. No, thank you. I just wanted to give a bit of clarity again. We're trying to make it as easy and attainable for everybody to understand. So, Ashley, um, what change are you seeing that's really exciting you within this industry? Yeah, I've been with the organization for 12 years. I've actually been in the textile industry my whole life. Uh, my family are cotton farmers in West Texas. And um, through that process, both from my background and also from the work that we've been doing, learning about what makes a material preferred has been kind of the, the foundation of the work that we do to define those production systems that, as Howard mentioned, the status quo today is, is land degradation, it's pollution. Um, there are a lot of things that can be done to change those production systems. And so that our evolving of understanding what changes need to happen is, I think, what's exciting to me. We at Textile Exchange define a preferred material as one that reduces and avoids harm, but also that can drive and deliver long-term impacts and outcomes, like better soil, uh, better water, all of those types of things. Um, the other thing that we do as an organization is we track and monitor the usage of preferred materials over time. And whenever I first started, we were really focusing on organic cotton and just starting to focus on some of these other materials. We've seen enormous growth through the past decade of increases in the use of preferred materials. And actually, Puma is one of the leaders um, in the, our material change index, which tracks the usage of preferred materials. They're in the top 10 users of recycled polyester. They're really close to their goal of 100% preferred cotton. And so seeing that kind of change is really exciting. But if you put that in context to the growth of, of the industry overall, it it's demonstrates how far we still have to go. Because while organic cotton has grown, it's actually stayed flat as a percentage um, because the amount of cotton that has increased has, has increased so much. Polyester is also grown significantly. Recycled polyester is growing, but it's still a small percentage, somewhere around 10 to 14 percent of polyester. Howard talked about textile to textile recycling, which is fantastic, but that's a very small percentage of the amount of recycled polyester. Most of that is, is bottle to plastic, bottle to textile. And so Textile Exchange really believes that if we're going to continue driving, we need to increase the scale, but we also need to increase the use of natural materials that are um, grown and produced in balance with nature. We need to avoid or eliminate virgin fossil fuel materials, and we need to increase textile to textile recycling. Definitely agree with you. Now, moving on just slightly, um, Monica. You and I have done this for about 10 years now, been in this kind of influencer bubble for a little while now. Um, and I, I don't know about you, but maybe five, 10 years ago, sustainability was not seen as sexy. And I think it's starting to get to that kind of, that status <laughs> now. Um, what's the biggest challenge that you found in getting people to view sustainability as like stylish? 
Yeah. Um, <clears throat> as you were mentioning, 10 years ago really was like the uh, dark ages for sustainable fashion. Um, I remember when I first started to think about dressing sustainably and wanting others to dress sustainably, there wasn't really much to go from. Um, and the first thought that came to mind when you thought about sustainable fashion was, you know, okay, a potato sack, or am I going to dress, you That know? was always my thought. I was like, oh my God, I've got to wear a load of hemp. <laughs> I'm going to have to wear a right. potato sack all the time. <laughs> hemp, or, you know, just being dressed like, I don't know, um, kind of a hippie vibe, which there is absolutely nothing wrong with. My mom dresses like a hippie, so, <laughs> you know, props to her. Um, but as you said, if you wanted to be more seen as stylish or sexy or whatever, um, it was really, really hard, you know? Um, and also just to get people to understand what sustainability meant um, was really, really difficult. Uh, now, we are extremely spoiled for choice. Um, there is so much out there now. Innovation is accelerated like crazy for the past 10 years. I say that, you know, first find out what is your style. I think that is super important in, in staying sustainable. You have to know what your style is so that you're not constantly giving in to micro trends. And once you know your style, you can start to look for sustainable alternatives. That means sustainable materials, sustainable brands, sustainable buys, um, or buying secondhand. When you know your style, it's much, much easier to do so. So yeah. I think once you figure out your style, then you can start buying sustainably a lot easier. and just, you know, research right now. Anything you can search for, you can basically search, okay, sustainable alternative, and something will come up, which yeah. is great, which is amazing. Yeah, definitely. I think for me, it was seeing over the past couple of years that, that even the style changed, and you raised that point. It was like wearing... My vision of sustainability way back when was wearing like a muumuu or something like that, just like essentially a house dress is what I was thinking. But now you can have style like this is from a slow fashion brand and I can wear something that is my style and is cool and as Reggie said, great outfit. Yeah, thanks, babes. But to be able to wear something like this and still feel stylish and know that I'm not impacting the environment in such a negative way is a huge bonus. Um, so thank you for that. But um, moving on, Howard, what success have you had kind of with material innovation beyond what we discussed with the recycled polyester and things like that? And there's a number of projects that we're working on at PMR at the moment. Um, I think one of the most exciting ones is we're developing uh, plastic-free products uh, where we've taken out the polyester from the fabrics and the sewing threads and the care labels and the embellishments and we're sort of generating, replacing those with man-made cellulosic fibre. So we've got like a mono material. So two things, one is it's easy, much easier to recycle. So we've got that sort of re ease of recycling sort of in the process. But also, we're not putting plastic into our garments anymore. Um, and therefore, we're not contributing to ocean plastic. Yeah. So we're sort of killing two birds with one stone. Not just that, I guess also the microplastics that I think Izzy raised on the previous panel. You don't want to be, as you're washing something, every item of clothing it, like sheds little mini p fibers and they're called microplastics. So if you're not putting the plastic into the, into the fiber, I guess you're mitigating that on another side. Correct. And you're thinking about the afterlife of a product and yes, doing that as well. Absolutely. Okay. Anything else? Um, a number of other things. Uh, one thing that comes to mind is... Um, as um, my colleague from DBL mentioned earlier about recycling cotton, um, using coloured cotton waste is a problem because it's got a colour, so it impacts what you can put it into. So we're developing a process now where we colour sort the cutting waste mm. um, and then blend it with fibre dyed virgin cotton and blend it two together to come up with an overall um, colour shade of our standard colours of Puma colour palette. And these are sort of long-term colours that don't change season after season, like high-risk red for Puma. Uh, and then we can offer it in stock lots, maybe 10 tonnes, and it'll last a season, it'll all be the same colour. Fantastic. Um, and we're sharing those with the design teams so that we can generate um, more sustainable cotton fabrics using coloured uh, recycled cotton. It's a, that's fantastic because essentially you're, show, you're slowing down the production process and slowing down the amount, the scale at which you're producing. I Another say. way to sort yeah. of look at it is that, you know, 20, 25 percent of our waste that we put into the yarn mm. is already dyed. Yeah. So we're using 20 percent less dye stuffs, 20 percent less chemicals to produce our cotton fabrics. Um, so it sort of goes up one level, it's sort of a hybrid 
um, sustainable cotton. Fantastic. Um, Mohammed, we were talking about polyester and how we can use cotton on all these things just now. So from a production point of view, what's the biggest opportunity in the kind of material space right now? Well, this is like in our facility, like we have uh, every day 15 tons of cutting waste. So what we are doing now, we recycle it. Did you 100%. say 15 tons of cutting waste? Right? In, in our facility. Wow, that's... So waste, because we produce 130 tons fabric a day. Wow. So now, you know, this is like that uh, all the cotton fabric, I mean, cutting waste, we are recycling it. And this is a good thing that, and other, the color we separate it as Howard explained. And besides that, we are using uh, the uh, 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 recycled polyester out of pet bottle. Oh, wow. So it is, uh, it is PSF, uh, poly uh, poly uh, polyester, polyester staple fiber, we get it from the pet bottle. So at per, you know, by this uh, request, we also use recycled polyester. We are using also dope dyeing polyester, which really helps to reduce carbon emission, and it has got less uh, wasters. I mean, and also we are, we are using CD polyester, cationic diable polyester, so which usually regular polyester takes uh, to dye 135 degrees Celsius for dyeing process, but CD polyester, uh, you, you, uh, CD polyester that you can dye 100 and, uh, 110 degrees Celsius. So it really saves a lot of energy. Oh, fantastic. So this is good, and, and also uh, we, we are using uh, uh, recyclum dyes. So recyclum dyes is uh, is a, uh, is a uh, extracted from the cotton, uh, cotton cut clips. Uh, this is uh, we are using, we have started using it, and we also use the dyes from mushroom and seaweed. Oh, wow. Yeah, so these are the innovation is going on now. The whole industry is transforming towards that, and Bangladesh government's factories are really adopting it. And the mostly this industry in Bangladesh uh, is uh, transforming towards recycle and energy efficiency. So we have like more than 150 lead certified industry, industry and green industry, most of them, and the government has given certain policy re uh, reform that getting incentives for this. So people are uh, leverage it and for some factory they are doing it, you know, for the good reason. And I see that uh, as a, the way the industry is growing towards sustainability, I think that Bangladesh government study will, uh, the Bangladesh government study will be a good position for this future yeah, challenge. Definitely, definitely agree with you. And I think Thank you. it was so important what you just said there because you've said that it's going on across the industry. And I think the only way that we're going to make that lasting change is to do it at scale. Mm. Um, so moving on, Ashley, your organization's mission to create leaders in preferred fiber and, and materials industry, what role do these materials play in reducing the carbon emissions that Mohammed was talking about? What are you kind of seeing going on? Textile Exchange in the last couple of years has announced a new strategy, which if you know us, you've probably heard us talk about it. We are aiming to help drive the industry on the path to a 45% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. This is backed by, um, by science, um, by global boundaries. This is what we know needs to happen in order to prevent global warming. And this has actually really energized us as an organization because I think what I talked about before, this definition of preferred, it's really easy to think about, okay, I have a choice between virgin polyester or recycled. Obviously, I'm going to choose recycled. I have a choice between conventional cotton, organic cotton. Definitely organic is, is the right choice. And having a definition of preferred allows you to make those kinds of choices 
But the thing that it led us to is also to think about the entire system. Is, are those changes, those substitutions that we're asking the industry to make, are those actually going to be enough to get us to that 45% reduction? And we've looked at the numbers, um, and Laura mentioned in the previous panel that we do a lot of validation, we do a lot of data collection to actually track what's really happening. And what the data shows us is the answer is no. It's not going to be enough um, to just swap out what materials exist now for the materials that exist now that are better. Uh, we need to continue improving. And so for textile exchange, the three levers that we have identified that we think will actually get the industry to that 45% reduction goal is yes, material substitution, choosing materials that are better, like organic, like recycled. We also think innovation is going to be key um, to continue the reductions in the materials that we're using today, to continue using technology that allows those greenhouse gas emissions to continue to fall, to develop new materials um, that are from substances that maybe we haven't typically seen in shoes or in clothing. But the third thing is to slow down growth. If we continually use more and more new materials to make our products, we're just making that goal that we're setting for ourselves harder and harder to meet. And so Textile Exchange really believes that slowing down growth, using less new materials to make the products that we love, is going to have to be part of that pathway to 45%. That's really fantastic. Um, as you were saying that, I was sitting here thinking, this is phenomenal. And I know that we're talking about it on, on a larger scale. I just want to bring the point maybe slightly left and think about it in terms of small businesses. Mm -hmm. How do they then achieve these goals and these lower carbon emissions if you're a smaller brand with possibly not the same amount of capital or assets behind you to be able to invest in these innovations? What can they do? One of the things that is unique, I think, about our organization and also just the um, kind of where sustainability is today is there's a lot more conversations happening between companies that maybe traditionally were competitors and also between people who are in different parts of the supply chain. So our organization was one of the first to bring farmers and brands around the same table together. And I think as a small business, you have an even bigger opportunity, an even maybe slightly easier chance to get to know your suppliers and to build relationships with the, the people that are selling you your fabric, potentially to find out where that fabric is coming from. Um, those types of relationships, you know, we do certification, we do verification. That's been my background. I will tell you it's really important. It does not replace a relationship with a really strong supply chain partner. And small companies, small businesses have that opportunity just as much as large companies do. No, that's fantastic. Thank you for answering that. Um, yeah, because it's a passion of mine. I want to know how we can affect that change within smaller growing businesses. And more to that point, Monica, um, we've spoken about kind of the industry side of it, but what are you hearing when it comes to like your audience and some of your audience may even be in this room and their awareness on the points that both Dana and Ashley have highlighted? Um, I think the number one thing is communication, right? Um, they want to understand what, what kind of materials are better, not just how they're made, but how are they better. So if you, for an instance, put up cotton, cotton and then organic cotton, how is it better? What's the impact difference? Um, I can also speak from my own personal experience. I started off with oil and gas management. I studied oil and gas, which is, you know, a complete U-turn. Um, and the reason of that U-turn was because I studied uh, renewable energy within that course. We had to talk about um, innovative materials and alternatives. And when I saw the alternatives, I was like, okay, I'd rather do this. And then I turned towards sustainability. So when you actually communicate as a brand, this is what we're doing, but how is that going to impact your choices, what this is? Um, I think that's really key because that's the, the, the question I get asked all the time is, is it greenwashing? How can I know it's not greenwashing? What are they doing? What's the difference? 
and also, if I do something, is it going to make a difference at all? Because a lot of times people feel like, okay, this is such a minor difference, and is it even a difference because just you, you put green or conscience on a label? Um, so I think labeling and actually giving the right information to consumers is super important, and also encouraging that you know small steps do make a difference because your small step is essentially funding um, a supply chain and people that really put so much effort into creating new materials um, and you are funding that through buying something that is sustainably progressive rather than I don't I like to, I don't like to say sustainable because it's such a double-edged sword um, so sustainably progressive are you actually choosing to support the people that were behind this material not just the brand that brought it to the market so, yeah. Yeah, just before we move on to the questions from Slido and to the audience, can you just give a quick overview as to what greenwashing is, please? So greenwashing is when a brand, say, claim that they are sustainable in some way, and we even touched on it before, and yeah. then that maybe 1% of something is slightly recycled or just their, I don't know, packaging is not, um, is recyclable. That's it, their packaging, not even the whole product itself or anything. So that, that's what people see as um, greenwashing. And when we want to avoid that, we want to give like a full view of exactly what we're doing, how it's better. And it's usually more than 1%, obviously, it has yeah. to be um, a lot more than that. Uh, so when greenwashing is that people just use these big words like green, conscience, eco-friendly, whatever that means, instead of giving actual facts to how it's better. Yeah, definitely. So we're going to move on to the questions from Slido and some questions from you guys here, and then I'll add a few more in and we'll just continue the conversation. So to all the panelists, what do you see as the biggest barriers for preventing waste within Puma and its supply chain? Whoever wants to take it. <laughs> Uh, I'll start with that one. Yeah. Um, I think it's basically getting the suppliers, being the T1, T2 suppliers, and possibly T3, to think about how they can recycle the waste they've got from the factory. Um, quite often, they rely upon waste management companies just to come and sort of empty the bins, and it's sort of out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. And this is quite often downcycled and not upcycled, or just burnt off in incineration. So. Um, it's really, if we're going to change the way we sort of manage our waste, is to encourage our T1 and T2s to think about how their product can be recycled and upcycled. And then ensuring that at every stage of the supply chain. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what's interesting, I visited DBL in Bangladesh um, three years ago, and they were just putting together a pilot, a small machine to recycle the cutting waste. Um, I was there two weeks ago, and now they've got this huge factory um, it's like 10,000 square feet, brand new sort of recycling equipment, and now it's f fully operational. Fantastic. It's just incredible, gone from a sort of a, the kernel of an idea to sort of like full scale. But this is what I think it takes. It's all of us working on something, trialing it, and increasing and improving yeah. the process. So yeah, um, Dana, just quickly, ooh, <laughs> the heavens have opened. Why does the industry have to work together to achieve large-scale recycling or even net positive, in, uh, net positive industry? Yeah, so systemic change isn't achievable, as we heard earlier, by one actor alone. We need everybody from the value chain to come together. We need brands, we need manufacturers, we need recyclers, we even need waste collectors and sorters. But we also need an, an enabling environment, which, which is made possible by policymakers as well. So, you know, truly to, to have this change at a, at a systems level, we need collaboration, especially to meet the future demand that we see. And that has to be in line with the Paris Agreement toward a 1.5 degree pathway. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we've got another question from Slido. So this one specifically to Monica. What are the key things you consider when buying clothes? Oh, I'll tell you the number one thing is quality because I always think of a product's life cycle. So whatever that may be, you touched on it before. How nice is it to go through your mother's closet, your father's closet, any relative um, and get nice hand-me-downs for that quality is key. So whenever I buy something, I always think, okay, once I'm done with this, 
who is it going to go to, will it last? And usually, if it's bad quality, no one's that excited to you know, receive a really badly, poorly made item. You know, can you imagine in 20 years giving it to your kids or whatever, it's something that's really poorly made? Um, so quality for me is always 100% key, wherever, whether I buy from sustainable brands, uh, a sustainable purchase, secondhand, whatever. Quality is really important to me. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Quality over quantity, that's what we say. We've got another one from Slido to anybody from Puma, so I'm guessing Howard, you'll take this one. Do you plan to scale up the re-jersey project? Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we started a year ago and we did 400 kilograms. Uh, last month we did 20 tonnes. And we now see there's a growing appetite for this recycled product from garment to garment. Uh, so we're looking at ways of how we can scale things up. Scalability is proving to be quite a challenge, is to find the capacities that are available today. So we've got various industries involved. So we're, we're sort of overlapping into the plastics industry for looking for depolymerization and repolymerization uh, capacity. Uh, and then there's collection. Fantastic. So the problem is that the, the scale of flow of materials is very different. So you've got take-back schemes, you've got collection processes, which is more of like a drip feed. So you're collecting this, and then when you go to recycling, it's 20 tons. So sort of start, stop, 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 collect, 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 and start, stop. But honestly, um, we're making good inroads into this whole sort of supply chain of feedstock. Um, where our aspirations are, um, I think in a two or three years' time, we want to get up to be able to produce um, something like four million garments a year. Fantastic. Um, using uh, the re jersey process. Fantastic. Now that would be amazing. Um, I'd like to put it to the audience. Has anybody got a question? If you'd like to raise your hand. Anyone? Don't be shy. Oh, we've got one over here. Um, this is sort of a little bit on the back of the first panel as well, um, but relevant for the recycling materials question. Have you ever considered collaborating on a large scale with other brands? Um, there's a lot of take back schemes in store which rely on customers actually bringing clothing to you and ideally they have to be your own brands, but in terms of the consumer environment and kind of de domesticating, recycling clothing and textile. If all of the big brands got together and actually created a proper recycling program, also possibly in relation with councils and things like that to properly take back clothing, you'd have much less drip feed coming in and clothing recycling happening potentially on a mass scale in order to help to upscale some of these recycling institutions as well. Is that something you'd consider? Again, absolutely. <laughs> um, I think there's a number of points in your question. I think, first of all, um, Puma have entered into a consortium with five other brands, four other brands, uh, with Carbios, who was on stage earlier, uh, for enzymatic recycling of polyester. So we're partnering with Patagonia, with um, Solomon Shoes, with On Running, um, and soon to be um, some accessory suppliers. Um, <laughs> so working together, we hope we can achieve scale and, and um, size. Um, in terms of take-back schemes, uh, we've just started to look into the upstream supply of feedstocks uh, and couldn't agree more that working together. So we've, started, we've contracted um, ICO in Germany, who H&M use and a few other brands use as well. So we've agreed to take feedstock from them. So I think now the challenge is for all the brands is to secure feedstock because the demand is there, the, the appetite is there, it's just is the supply there. So we're looking at various different uh, channels to secure the feedstock. And I think there's a bit of a scrum going on at the moment, um, both for polyester and for cotton. Yeah, fantastic. 
So for our final question, um, I'm going to go back to Slido, but I'm going, it says to the panelists, but I'm going to direct it to you, Monica. So what do you consider a sustainable product? Oh, um, a sustainable product falls into two categories for me. So either it's something that comes from a second-hand market, that means that the product life cycle is long enough for me to consider it sustainable. It's not just one person that's used it. Um, and then the other way is like sustainable materials, innovation, um, sourcing, however it's done, either through a brand that position themselves as being sustainable or um, a sustainable purchase, which is through using materials that are more innovative. And I think when you do that as a consumer, you are signaling, which is really important to the industry, that this is what I want to buy from. And you are helping funding innovation that we talked about before, because yeah. innovation really is key. So when you buy into sustainability, um, when it comes to materials, you are really helping funding the progress of innovation. So I think that's how I think about it. Fantastic. So I'd like to just thank you all for your time and thank you for joining us. And if we'd like to give them all a massive round of applause. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one more time for our last panel, please. That was fantastic. Come on, let's keep it going. Okay. Um, we are about to take a very short break. If you're a cigarette smoker, good luck because the heavens have opened. Uh, but we're going to take a short break for five to ten minutes, no more than that. Uh, and when we return, wait, we ain't finished just yet. Where are you going? Uh, when we return, <laughs> I'm literally out shaming you. You're literally trying to leave. Sorry about that. Uh, when we return, uh, Miss Moneypenny herself, Naomi Harris, Oscar-nominated actress, will be joining us. We're really looking forward to hearing what she has to say. Ade will be back on the stage as well, as well as Jack Harris. And we're going to be talking about turning anxiety into action. Uh, now, for those of you online, hello to the cameras. Uh, hello to our friends online. Um, we will be back in five to ten minutes' time. And... Uh, don't go anywhere. And remember, if you've got any questions for us, fire them in. Uh, and for you guys here in the room, there are two places that you can go to. I'm losing you. Uh, you could go to the T-shirt print in room, and you can also check out those immersive experiences as well. We'll see you in five to ten, all right? Thank you. <laughs>